Hi and welcome to another story and today we have part two of the story of Tracy Beaker by Jacqueline Wilson continuing from page 46. They were great at first Julie and Ted that's what I called them right from the start they didn't want to be a prissy auntie and uncle and Julie said she didn't want me to call her mum because I already had a mum. I thought such a lot of Julie when she said that. She wasn't exactly my idea of a glamorous foster mum. She had this long, wispy brown hair and she wore sludge-coloured smocky things and sandals. And Ted looked a bit of a wimp too with his glasses and his beard and weirdo comfy walking shoes. Not so much hush puppy or shut your face hound dog, but I thought they were the sort of couple you could really trust. Ha! Because I went to live with them and I thought we were getting on really great, though they were a bit boringly strict about stuff like sweets and bedtimes and horror movie videos. But when Julie started to wear bigger smocks than ever and lolled about on the sofa and Ted got all misty-eyed behind his glasses and I started to realise that something was up. And so I asked them what it was and they hedged and pulled faces at each other and then they looked shifty and told me that everything was fine and I knew they were lying. Things weren't fine at all. They didn't even have the guts to tell me themselves. They left it to Elaine. She'd only just started to be my social worker then. I've had heaps because they kept moving around and leaving me behind and I got passed on like a parcel. I wasn't that keen on Elaine in those days. In fact, I was really narked with her because I'd had this man social worker, Terry, before her and he used to call me Smarty and he used to give me the odd tube of Smarties too and I felt Elaine was a very poor substitute. I wish I hadn't thought of those Smarties. I wish I had some now. I'm simply starving. I'm sure Elaine marked me down as sulky and non-cooperative in her little notebook. The day she told me that Julie and Ted bombshell, I'm sure, she scribbled Tosa Tracy totally gobsmacked because Julie was having her own baby after years of thinking she couldn't have any kids. I didn't get it at first. So what's the problem, Elaine, I said. We'll be a proper family then, four of us instead of three. Elaine was having difficulties finding the right words. She kept opening her mouth and closing it again, not saying a sausage. You look just like a fish when you do that, did you know? I said cheekily, because my heart was starting to hammer hard against my chest and I knew that when Elaine eventually got the words out, I wouldn't like the sound of them. The thing is, Tracy, well, Julie and Ted have loved fostering you and they've got very fond of you, but you see, now they're having their own baby, they feel that they're not really going to be able to cope. Oh, I get it, I said in this jokey, silly voice. So they're going to give the boring old baby away because they can't cope with it and keep me because they had me first, didn't they? Tracy, they're not really going to dump me, are they? They still very much want to keep in touch with you. And so why can't I go on living with them? Look, I'll help all I can. Julie doesn't need to worry. I'll be just like a second mum to this baby. I know all, all what to do. I can give it its bottle and change its soggy old nappy and thump it on its back to bring up its wind. I'm dead experienced where babies are concerned. Yes, I know, Tracy, but that's the trouble. You see, when Julie and Ted first fostered you, we did tell them a bit about your background and the trouble you had in your first foster home. You know, when you shut the baby up in the cupboard. That was Steve, and he wasn't a baby. He was a foul little toddler, and he kept mucking up our bedroom, so I tidied him up into the cupboard just for a bit so I could get everything straightened out. And there was the ghost game that got totally out of hand. Oh, that... All those little kids loved that game. I was ever so good at finding the right hiding places. And then I'd start an eerie sort of moan. And then I'd jump out at them wearing this old white sheet. And everyone got scared silly. No, they didn't. They just squealed because they were excited. I was the one who should have been scared because they were all the Ghostbusters, you see. And I was the poor little ghost. And OK, OK, but the point is, Tracy, it makes it plain in your records that you don't always get on well with little children. That's a whopping great lie. What about Camilla? I looked after her at that children's home and she loved me. She really did. Yes, I'm sure that's true, Tracy. But, well, the thing is, Julie and Ted still feel they don't want to take any chances. They're worried you might feel a bit uncomfortable with a baby in the house. So they're pushing me out. But like I said, they still want to keep in touch with you and maybe take you out for tea sometimes. No way, I said. I don't want to see them ever again. Oh, Tracy, that's silly. That's just cutting off your nose to spite your face, said Elaine. That's such a daft expression. How on earth would you go about it? It wouldn't half hurt. It hurts a lot, leaving Julie and Ted's. They wanted me to stay for a few months, but I couldn't clear out of there quick enough. So here I am in this dump. They've tried to see me twice, but I wasn't having any of it. I don't want any visitors. Thanks very much. Apart from my mum. I wonder where she is. And why didn't she leave a forwarding dress at that last place? And how will she ever get to find me here? Yeah, that's the problem. I bet she's been trying and trying to get hold of me, but she doesn't know where to look. Last time I saw her, I was at Auntie Peggy's. I bet mum's been around to Auntie Peggy's and I bet that silly old smoking machine, smacking machine, wouldn't tell her where I'd gone. 
So, I bet my mum got really mad with her. And if she found out just how many times that Auntie Peggy smacked me, then wow, kapow, splat, bang, I bet my mum would really let her have it. I don't half want my mum. I know why I can't sleep. It's because I'm so starving hungry. That's why. Crying always makes me hungry. Not that I've been crying now. I don't ever cry. I think maybe I'll try slipping down to the kitchen. Jenny's bound to be fast asleep by now. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I'm back. I've had my very own midnight feast, and it was absolutely delicious too. Well, it wasn't bad. I couldn't find any chocolates, of course, and that was what I really fancied. But I found an opened packet of cornflakes and got stuck into them. And then I tried raiding the fridge. There weren't too many goodies. I didn't go to a bundle on tomorrow's uncooked mince or yesterday's cold custard, but I poked my finger in the butter and then dabbed it into the sugar bowl, and that tasted fine. I did quite a lot of poking and dabbing, actually. I know Jenny might notice, so I got my little fingernail and drew these weeny lines like teeth marks and then did some paw prints all over the butter so she'd think it was a mouse. Mice do eat butter, don't they? They like cheese, which is the same sort of thing. Of course, this is going to have to be a mountaineering mouse, armed with ice pick and climbing boots, able to trek up the grim north face of the frigid air, and then it's got to develop mighty mouse muscles to prise open the door of the fridge to get the feast inside. Maybe Jenny will still be a teensy bit suspicious, but I can't help that. At least she didn't catch me while I was noshing away at my midnight feast. Someone else did, though. Not in the kitchen. Afterwards, when I was sneaking up the stairs again. They're very dark, these stairs, and they take a bit of careful negotiating. One of the little kids is quite likely to have a teddy or a rattle or a building brick halfway up, and you can come an awful cropper and wake the entire household. So I was feeling my way very, very cautiously when I heard this weird little moaning sound coming from up on the landing. So I looked up sharpish, and I could just make out this pale little figure, all white and trailing, and it was so exactly like a ghost that I opened my mouth to scream. But Tracy Beaker has a lot of bottle. I'm not scared of anybody, not even ghosts. So I clapped my hand over my mouth to stop the scream and pattered right on up the stairs to confront this puny little piece of ectoplasm. Only it wasn't a ghost after all. It was just snivelling, drivelling Peter Ingham clutching some sheets. Whatever are you up to, creep? I whispered. Nothing, Peter whispered back. Oh, sure. You just thought you'd take your sheets for a walk in the middle of the night, I said. Peter flinched away from me. You've wet them, haven't you? I said. No, Peter mumbled. He's a useless liar. Of course you've wet them. And you've been trying to wash them out in the bathroom, I know, so that people won't guess. I, I don't tell, Tracy, please, Peter begged. What do you take me for? I'm no telltale, I said. And look, you don't have to fuss. Just get Jenny on her own in the morning and whisper to her. She'll sort it all out for you. She doesn't get cross. Really? Truly. And what you do now, you get yourself some dry sheets from the airing cupboard, right? And some pyjamas. Goodness, <laughs> you don't know anything, do you? How long have you been in care? Three months, one week, two days, said Peter. Is that all? I've been in and out of care nearly all my life, I said, getting the sheets for him. So, why are you here now then? Your mum and dad got fed up with you? Can't say as I blame them. They died when I was little, so I lived with my nan. But then she got old and then, and then she died too, Peter mumbled. And I didn't have anyone else, so I had to come here. And I don't like it. Well, of course you don't like it. But this is a lot better than most children's homes. You ought to have tried some of the places I've been in. They lock you up and they beat you and they practically starve you to death. And then when they do give you meals, it's absolutely disgusting. They pretend it's meat, but it's really chopped up worms and dried dog's muck and... Shut up, Tracy, Peter said, holding his stomach. Who are you telling to shut up, I said, but not really fiercely. Go on, you better shove off back to your room. Put your dry pyjamas on, you're shivering. OK, Tracy, thanks. He paused, fidgeting and fumbling with his sheets. I wish you would be my friend, Tracy. I don't really bother making friends, I said. There's not much point, because my mum's probably coming to get me soon, and then I'll be living with her, so I won't need any friends here. Oh, said Peter, and he sounded really disappointed. Still, I suppose you can be my friend just for now, I said. I don't know why I said it. Who wants to be lumbered with a silly little creep like that? I'm too kind-hearted. That's my trouble. There wasn't much point in getting to sleep, because when I did eventually nod off, I just had these stupid nightmares. It's as if there's a video inside my head and it switches itself on the minute, minute my eyes close and I keep hoping it's going to be showing the great comedy that'll have me in stitches. But then the creepy music starts and I know I'm in for it. Last night was the great horror movie of all time. I was stuck in the dark somewhere and there was something really scary coming up quick behind me. So I had to run like mad. Then I got to this big round pool 
and there were these stepping stones with people perching on them. And I jumped onto the first one and there was no room at all because that fat Auntie Peggy was spread all over it. I tried to cling to her, but she gave me a big smack and sent me flying. So then I jumped onto the next stepping stone and Julie and Ted were there and I tried to grab hold of them, but they just turned their backs on me and didn't even try to catch me when I fell. And so I had to try to reach the next stepping stone, but I was in the water doing my doggy paddle and it was getting harder and harder. And every time I swam to a stepping stone, all these people prodded at me with sticks and pushed me away. And I kept going under the water and, and then I woke up. And I know that whenever I dream about water, it spells trouble with a capital T. I had to make my own dash to the airing cupboard and the laundry basket. I was unfortunate enough to bump into Justine too. She didn't look as if she'd slept much either. He eyes, it's, her eyes seemed a bit on the red side. I couldn't help feeling a bit mean then, in spite of everything. So I gave her this big smile and I said, I'm sorry about what happened to your alarm clock, Justine. I didn't exactly tell her that I did it because I still don't know that it is really, it really was me. And anyway, I'd be a fool to admit it, wouldn't I? But I told her that I was really sorry, just like Jenny had suggested. Only there's no point trying to be nice to pigs like Justine Littlewood. She didn't smile back and graciously accept my apologies. You'll be even sorrier when I finished with you, Tracy Beaker, she hissed. And what have you been doing, eh? Wet the bed again, baby. She hissed a lot more too. Stupid, insulting things. I'm not going to waste any time writing them all down. Words can't hurt me anyway. Only I can't help being just a bit worried about that threat. What's she going to do to get her own back for the clock? If only she had poxy locks on our if only we had poxy locks on our bedroom doors. Still, at least we've got separate bedrooms in this home, even though they're weeny like cupboards. It's new policy. Children in care need their own space. And I want to stay in my own space doing all this writing. But Jenny has just put her head around my door and told me to buzz out into the garden with the others. And I said, no fear. Being in a home is lousy at the best of times, but I just can't stick it in the school holidays when you're all cooped up together and the big ones bully you and the little ones pester you and the ones your own age gang up on you and have secrets together and call you names. How's about trying to make it up with Justine? Jenny suggested, coming to sit on my bed. So I snorted and told her she was wasting her time, and more to the point, she was wasting my time because I wanted to get on with my writing. You've done ever such a lot, Tracy, said Jenny, looking at all these pages. <laughs> we'll be running out of paper soon. Then I'll use the backs of birthday cards or bog roll, anything. I'm inspired, see? I can't stop. Yes, <laughs> you've really taken to this writing. Going to be a writer when you grow up, eh? Maybe. I hadn't thought about it before. I was always sure I was going to be on telly with my own chat show, the Tracy Beaker Experience, and I'd walk out onto this stage in a sparkly dress and all the studio audience would clap and cheer and all these really famous celebrities would fight tooth and nail to get on my show to speak to me, but I reckon I could write books too. Tracy Beaker, the true life story. Three cheers for Tracy Beaker. Tracy Beaker comes out tops. Tracy Beaker, topping tales. Tracy Beaker two. More tales of Tracy Beaker. Tell you what, Tracy. We've got a real writer coming around sometime this afternoon. You could ask her a few tips. What's she coming for? Oh, she's doing this article for a magazine about children in care. Oh, that boring old stuff, I said, pretending to yawn, but instead I started fizzing away. I wouldn't mind my story being written up in some magazine. A book would be better, of course, but maybe that could come later. I'd have to be careful what she said about me, though. Elaine, the pain, made a right mess of my newspaper advert. I was a child of the week in the local paper. If she'd only let me write it, I'd have been bowled over by people rushing to adopt dear little Tracy Beaker. I know just how to present myself in the right sort of way. Tracy Beaker, have you a place in your heart for dear little Tracy? Brilliant and beautiful, this little girl needs a loving home, very rich parents preferred, as little Tracy need lots of toys, presents and pets to make up for her tragic past. Elaine is useless, doesn't have a clue. She didn't even let me specially kitted, get specially kitted out for the photograph. We want you looking natural, Tracy, she said. Well, I turned out looking too flipping natural. Hair all over the place and a scowl on my face because that stupid photographer kept treating me like a baby, telling me to watch the birdie and the things Elaine wrote about me. Tracy. Tracy is a lively, healthy, chatty ten-year-old who has been in care for a number of years. Consequently, she has a few behavioural problems and needs firm, loving handling in a long-term foster home. I ask you, how could you do this to me, Elaine? I shrieked when I saw it. Is that the best thing you can say about me? That I'm healthy? And anyway, I'm not. What about my hay fever? I also say you're lively and chatty. Yeah, well, we all know what that means. Cheeky, difficult, bossy. You said it, Tracy, Elaine murmured. 
and all this guff about behaviour problems. <laughs> what do I do, eh? I don't go around beating people up. Well, not many. And I don't smash the furniture. Hardly ever. Tracy, it's very understandable that you have a few problems. I don't! And then, how could you ask for someone to handle me firmly? And lovingly, said Elaine. I put loving too. Oh yes, they'll tell me how much they love me as they lay into me with a cane. Honestly, Elaine, you're around the twist. You're just going to attract a bunch of creepy child beaters with this crummy advert. But it didn't even attract them. No one replied at all. Elaine kept telling me not to worry, as if it was somehow my fault. I know, if she'd only get her act together and do a really flash advert, there'd be heaps of offers, I bet. But maybe I'm wasting my time nagging Elaine. This woman who's coming this afternoon might be just the chance I've been waiting for. If she's a real writer, then she'll know how to jazz it all up, so I sound really fantastic. Only I've got to present myself to her in a special way, so that she'll pick me out from all the others and just do a feature on me. So, what am I going to do, eh? Aha! Uh -huh. Not aha, uh -huh, more like boo-hoo. Only I don't ever cry, of course. I don't want to write down what happened. I don't think I want to, to be a writer anymore. I tried, I really did. I went flying up to my bedroom straight after lunch and I did my best to make myself look pretty. I know my hair is untidy, so I tried scragging it back into these little sticky out plaits. Camilla had little plaits and everyone cooed over them and said how cute she looked. I thought my face looked a bit bare when I'd done the plaits, so I wetted some of the side bits with a spit and tried to make them go into curls. I still looked a bit boring, so I decided to liven my face up a bit. So I sneaked round to Adele's room. She's 16 and she's got a Saturday job in BHS and she's got a drawer absolutely chock-a-block with makeup. I borrowed a bit of blusher to give myself some colour in my cheeks and then I thought I'd try out a pink glossy lipstick too and mascara to make my eyelashes look long. I tried a bit on my eyebrows too to make them stand out and I put a lot of powder on to be like the icing on a cake. I thought I looked okay when I'd finished. Well, at least I looked different. I changed my clothes too. I didn't want this writer to see me in a scrubby old t-shirt and skirt. No way, it had to be posh frock time. Only, I didn't really have a posh frock of my own. I did try on a few of Adele's things, but somehow they didn't really suit me. So then I started thinking about all the other girls. Louise had this really fantastic frock that she got a couple of years ago from some auntie. A real posh party frock with smocking and a flouncy skirt and its own sewn-in frilly white petticoat. It was a bit small for her now, of course, but she could just about squeeze into it for special days, and Louise and I are about the same size. I knew Louise would go spare if she saw me parading around in her best party frock, but I, but I decided it might be worth it if I made a great impression on the writer woman first. So I beetled along the corridor towards her room, but I didn't have any luck. Louise was in her room with Justine. I heard their voices. They were discussing me, actually, and nappies. They were snorting with laughter, and normally I'd have marched right in and punched their silly, smirky faces. But I knew if I got into a fight, Jenny would send me to my room and make me stay there, and I'd miss out on meeting the woman writer. So with extreme self-control, I walked away, still musing on what I was going to wear. I know it's summer, but I'd started to feel a bit shaky and shivery, so I put on this mohair sweater that Julie knitted me for Christmas. When Julie and Ted dumped me, I vowed not to have anything to do with them, and I even thought about cutting up the mohair sweater into little woolly hankies, but I couldn't quite do it. It's a pretty fantastic sweater, actually, with the name Tracy in bright blue letters. That way, it's obvious it's mine, specially made for me. Of course, it's a bit tickly and prickly, but my mum once said, you have to suffer if you want to look beautiful. She's always looked beautiful. I don't half wish I look took after her. I wasn't too bad as a baby. I was still quite cute as a toddler. But then I went off in a big way. Still, I was trying my hardest to look okay. I only had my old skirt to wear with my mohair sweater and there were dark blue stains all down one side where a biro exploded in my pocket. But I couldn't help that. The woman writer might just think it was a tie and dye effect. And at least the blue matched the lettering on my jumper. I kept on prinking and preening in my room. I heard all the other kids go clattering downwards. I heard Louise and Justine go giggle, snigger, titter along the corridor. My face started burning so that I didn't need any blusher. Then I heard Adele rampaging around because some rotten so-and-so had been in her room and rifled through all her makeup and mucked it all up. I decided to hang about in my room a bit longer. I heard the front doorbell. I heard Jenny talking to someone down in the hall. I heard them go into the sitting room. I knew it was time to make my entrance. So I went running down the stairs and barging into the sitting room with this great big smile on my face. It's no use looking sad or sulky if you want people to like you. Mum always tells me to give her a big smile, even when she's saying goodbye to me. 
You can't look gloomy or it just upsets people and they don't want any more to do with you. We've got, you've got to give it this great big smile. Everyone looked at me when I went into the sitting room and they all smiled too. Just for a moment, I was daft enough to think they were all smiling back at me. But then I saw they were the wrong sort of smiles. They were smirks and Justine and Louise nudged each other and giggled and spluttered and whooped and Adele glared at me. Peter Ringham was the only one with a proper smile. He came over to me. He was blinking a bit rapidly. You, you look nice, Tracy, he said, but I knew he was lying. I was, <laughs> I, it was no use kidding myself. It was obvious I looked a right prat. Jenny's pretty laid back about appearances, but even she looked shocked at, shocked at the sight of me. And it looked like all the effort was for nothing because she didn't seem to have the woman writer person with her after all. I've seen uh, women writers on chat shows on the telly. They're quite glamorous, like film stars with glittery frocks and high heels and lots of jewellery. They look a bit like my mum, only nowhere near as pretty, of course. The woman with Jenny looked like some boring social worker or teacher. Scruffy brown hair, no makeup, scrubby t-shirt and rumpled jeans. A bit like me on an off day, grown up. I decided to slope off back to my bedroom. It seemed sensible to steer clear of Adele anyway, but Jenny caught hold of me by the back of my jumper. Hang about, Tracy. I thought you wanted to meet Cam Lawson. Who? I said. You know, the writer, I told you. Jenny hissed. Then she lowered her voice even more. Why are you wearing your winter jumper when it's boiling hot today? And what on earth have you done to your face? She thinks she looks pretty, said Justine, and she clutched Louise, and they both shrieked. Pipe down, you two, said Jenny. Tracy! Tracy! She hung on to me firmly, stopping me barging over to that stupid pair of titterers so as I could bang their heads together. Leave them, Tracy. Come and meet Cam. I wanted to meet this Cam. What sort of a silly name is that? Even though she didn't look a bit like a proper writer, but I sort of hung back. I'm usually the last person to feel shy, but somehow I suddenly didn't know or what to say or what to do. So I growled something at Jenny and twisted away from her and stood in a corner by myself just watching. Peter came trotting after me. Justine and Louise were still having hysterics at my appearance. You could tell they'd actually got over the giggles by this time, but Justine kept going into further false whoops, and Louise was almost as bad. Don't take any notice of them, Peter whispered. I don't, I said crossly. I like your jumper, said Peter, and your makeup, and the new hairstyle. Then you're mad. It looks a mess. I look a mess. I look a mess on purpose, I said fiercely. So you needn't feel sorry for me, Peter Ingham. You just clear off and leave me alone, right? Peter fidgeted from one foot to the other, looking worried. Clear off, you stupid little creep, I said. So, of course, he did clear off then. I wondered why I'd said that. OK, he is a creep, but he's not really that bad. I'd said he could be my friend, and it was a lot better when he was with me than standing all by myself, watching everyone over the other side of the room clustered around this cam person calling herself a writer. She's a weird sort of woman, if you ask me. She was chatting away, and yet you could tell she was really nervous inside. She kept fidgeting with her pen and notebook, and I was amazed to see she, she bites her nails. She's a great big grown-up woman, and yet she's, she does a dopey kids thing like that. Well, she's not great big. She's little and skinny, but even so. My mum has the most beautiful fingernails. Very long and pointy and polished. She varnishes them every day. I just love that smell of nail varnish. That sharp pear drop niff that makes your nostrils twitch. Jenny caught me happily sniffing nail varnish one day, and do you know what she thought? Only that I was inhaling it like glue sniffing. Did you ever? I let her think it too. I wasn't going to tell her I was just liking the smell because it reminds me of mum. I'll tell you another weird thing about Cam, what's it? She sat on one of our rickety old chairs. The, her legs all draped around the rungs and the, she talked to the children. Most adults that, came, that come here talk at children. They tell you what to do. They go on and on about themselves. They talk about you. They ask endless stupid questions. They make personal comments. Even the social workers are at it, or they strike this special nothing you can say would shock me sweetie pose, and they make stupid statements. I guess you're feeling really angry and upset today, Tracy, they twitter, and that when I've wrecked my bedroom or got into a fight or shouted at uh, or sworn at someone, so it's obvious I'm angry and upset. They do this to show me that they understand, only they don't understand peanuts. They're not the ones in care. I am. I thought Cam thing would ask questions and take down these case histories in her notebook, all brisk and organised. But from what I could make out, over in the corner, she had a very different way of doing things. She smiled a bit and fidgeted a lot and sort of weighed everybody up, and they all had a good stare at her. Two of the little kids tried to climb up onto her lap because they do that to anyone who sits down. It's not because they like the person, it's just they like being cuddled. They cry to have a cuddle with a cross-eyed gorilla, I'm telling you. 
Most strangers to children's homes get all flattered and make a great fuss of the littlies and come on like Mary Poppins. Miss Cam seemed a bit surprised, even a bit put out. I don't blame her. Little Wayne, in particular, has got the runniest nose of all time and he likes to bury his head affectionately into your chest, wiping it all down your front. Cam held him at arm's length and when he tried his burrowing trick, she distracted him by giving him her pen. He liked flicking the catch up and down. She let little Becky have a ride on her foot at the same time, so she didn't feel left out and ball. Becky kept trying to climb up onto her leg, pulling her jeans up. Some of Cam's leg got exposed. It was a pretty ropey sort of leg, if you ask me. A bit hairy for a start. My mum always shaves her legs, and she wears sheer see-through tights to show them off. This Cam had socks like a schoolgirl, only they were quite funny, brightly patterned socks. I thought the red and yellow bits were just squares at first, but then I got a bit closer, and I saw they were books. I wouldn't mind having a pair of socks like that myself, if I'm going to write all these books. She's written books. Old Cammy, Cammy Nicker. <laughs> the other kids asked her and she told them. She said she wrote some stories, but they didn't sell much. So she also wrote some, some, rom some romantic stuff. She doesn't like the romantic stuff. She doesn't look like the romantic type to me. Adele got interested and then because, because she loves all those soppy love books and Cam told her some titles and the boys all tittered and went yuck, yuck. And Jenny got a bit narked, but Cam said she didn't mind. They were mostly yuck, but she couldn't help it if that's what people like to read. Then they all started talking about reading. Maxie said he liked this book, Where the Wild Things Are, because the boy in that is called Max. And Cam said she knew that book and she made a wild thing face. And then everyone else did too, except me. I mean, I didn't want to join in a dopey game like that. My face did twitch a bit, but then I remembered all the makeup and I knew I'd look stupid. Besides, I'd got her sussed out. I could see what she was up to. She was finding out all sorts of things about all the kids without asking any nosy questions. Maxie went on about his dad being a wild thing. Adele went on and that, uh, on about love. Only, of course, real life wasn't like that. And love didn't ever last. And people split up and sometimes didn't even go on loving their children. Even little creepy Peter piped up about this Catherine Cookson books that his nan used to like. And he told Cam how he used to read them to her because her eyes had gone all blurry. And then his eyes went a bit blurry too, remembering his nan. And Cam's hand reached out, sort of awkwardly. She didn't quite manage to hold his hand. She just sort of tapped his bony wrist sympathetically. My nan's dead too. And my mum. They're both together in heaven now. Angels like, said Louise, lisping a bit. She always does that. Puts on this sweet little baby act where there, when there are grown-ups about. Like she was a little angel herself. Ha! <laughs> Our little Louise can be even worse than me when she wants. She's had three foster placements. No, was it four? Anyway, none of them worked out. But Louise always swore she didn't care. We used to have this pact that we'd do our best not to get fostered at all. And we'd stay together at the, the home till we got to 18. And then we'd get them the how to house us together in our own modern flat. We got it all planned out. Louise even started thinking about our furniture, the ornaments, the posters on the walls. And then Justine came and everything was spoilt. Oh, how I hate that Justine Littlewood. I'm glad I broke her silly little, little Mickey Mouse alarm clock. I'd like to break her into little bits and all. Anyway, Louise lists on about angels and I'll give that Cam her due. She didn't go all simpering and sentimental and pat Louise on her curly head and talk about the little darling. She stayed calm a matter of fact and started talking about angels and wondering what they would look like. That simple miss. They've got these big wings and long white nighties and those gold plate things stuck on their head, on the back of their heads, said Justine. Draw one for me, said Cam, offering her pen and notebook. OK, said Justine, though she can't draw for Toffee. Then she had a close look at the pen in her hand. Here, it's a Mickey Mouse pen. Look, Louise, see the little Mickey. Oh, miss, where did you get this pen? It's great. I love Mickey, I do. I've got this Mickey Mouse alarm clock. My dad gave it to me. Only some pig broke it deliberately. Justine looked over her shoulder and glared at me. I glared back, making out I couldn't care less. And I couldn't. My face started burning, but that was just because of my mohair sweater. Justine drew her stupid angel and Cam nodded at it. Yes, that's the way people usually draw angels. She looked at Louise. So, is this the way you imagine your mum and your nan? Well, sort of, said Louise. Is that the sort of nighty that your nan would wear? And what about the halo, the gold plate bit? Would that fit neatly on top of her hairstyle? Louise giggled uncertainly, not sure what she was getting at. You draw me what you think your mum and nan look like as angels, said Cam. Louise started, but she can't draw much either, and she kept scribbling over what she'd done. 
This is silly, she said, giving up. I knew what Cam was on about. I've, I'd have done a really great drawing of Louise's mum and Nan in natty angel outfits like this. I'll draw you an angel, miss, said Maxie, grabbing at the pen. I'll draw me as an angel, and I'll have big wings so I can fly like an aeroplane. Eow, eow. He went on making his dopey aeroplane noises all the time he was drawing. Then the others had a go, even the big ones. I got a bit nearer and craned my neck to see what they'd all drawn. I didn't think any of them were very inspired. I knew exactly what I'd draw if she asked me. It wouldn't be a silly old angel. And that is where we will leave part two of The Story of Tracy Beaker by Jacqueline Wilson. I'll be back soon with the next part of this fantastic story and lots more stories and videos coming your way very soon. If you would like to subscribe or hit a like, that's always appreciated. Thanks for your support, guys. Take care. Bye bye.